Because when he uh, passed on the treasurer's report, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. he mentioned there's enough money in the bank, and I thought he might say for the trip that he was going to take, and then, but no, he didn't. And, well, I appreciate getting the opportunity to get on the agenda. Um, uh, Ginger gave me a list about this long of topics she wanted me to cover. Um, we'll, tr we'll try to uh, we'll move through pretty quickly and get a few. And we'll try, try to talk uh, a lot on uh, butterflies, attracting butterflies, uh, because it's, it's all the rage now, and, and it's one of some of the topic that I really like, and, and we really need to get help the, the monarchs, so that's a good topic. We'll a little bit about the spring gardening. Uh, with the freezes, we're in a kind of a different situation than we have been in past years. These are these are pretty long-term freezes, so we'll we'll have we'll have some positive things. The peach trees will probably bloom and have leaves at the regular time now because we'll have enough cold weather. But uh, your citrus may have taken it again, um, and a lot of those cool weather plants that we. Uh, I keep thinking my articles, I keep saying how invincible they are. <clears throat> got all the blooms knocked off, and some of them got the foliage taken, so, so there are a lot of uh, topics that way, too. Um, Ginger mentioned the uh, South Texas Home Garden and Environmental Show. It's March 3rd and 4th. It's a, kind of a convention of master gardeners, and this is the second year we've done it. We combined the two. Uh, uh, Floresville Home and Garden Show and the Wilson County uh, Gardening Show. We were ra raising funds for the Alternative School uh, Horticulture Program for a number of years. And when the teacher retired and the uh, principal retired, they discontinued the horticulture program. So we had this kind of a neat event. We raised about $10,000 a year. And we thought, well, it's probably not a good idea to just discontinue it because there's so many good causes out there. So we're, we're doing a little exploring. We may have made it two days. We're moving to the, the Civic Center. Um, and we're, our goal is right now to support classroom gardens, to support environmental grants and classrooms, uh, general environmentally appropriate education programs, and expansion of a master gardener effort in the region. We've got, all, we've got support from all of the master gardener chapters all around the region. Bayer, Comal, uh, Gonzales, Guadalupe County, and uh, the new master gardener chapters, the classes are going to start in April. Anybody interested or if you know anybody that really wants to get some good training and get involved with it, an aggressive uh, gardening organization that gets involved in uh, important community projects. And it's a lot of fun, and you learn a lot. Uh, that's the Master Gardeners. The, the South Texas Master Gardener chapter is going to be uh, from Carnes, Wilson, and Atascosa County. We're going to try to combine all three counties. So if that interests you at all, um, uh, check it out. And then also, uh, yeah, you've got prime candidates are folks that are close to retirement or retirement. And they like gardening, and they want, they're a little worried about what they're going to do after retirement. Uh, the master gardeners can keep them busy. They'll, they'll, get the, they'll, be, uh, they'll be gardening with folks they like. They'll learn a lot. They'll have a lot of fun. And they'll be involved in significant projects in the community. And she mentioned the... Uh, the raffle, except she didn't mention the most important parts of the raffle. Yeah. Now it's, it's it's linked to this presentation because the top prize is a custom built hummingbird and butterfly garden, <laughs> and the tickets are two dollars a piece or six for ten dollars. And we've done it we've done it for thirteen years for the Mitchell Lake Audubon Center. Now we've shifted that the, the, this this raffle over to the South Texas uh, Home Garden and Environmental Show, and it'll be another fundraiser. We don't charge anything for the show. And so we raise the funds with an auction and the uh, vendor to fill up, uh, fill up the Civic Center last year, and it's uh, already half filled up. Um, and then the, uh, the raffle will be uh, fundraising too. Custom Hill Hummingbird Butterfly Garden on the 
the site of your choice. Some people do it at their favorite church, their school, or their, their uh, own property. Uh, the plants, this year Fannix is providing the plants. Um, drip irrigation system, uh, the local uh, irrigation contractor is providing those. The files is providing the, the mulch, compost, and rock. And the planting is going to be done by the gardening volunteers of South Texas. So it's kind of cool. Other prizes include gift certificates and uh, for, for area nurses, and including uh, the uh, San Antonio area, and then also antique roses. Where they'll have a, a big bunch of antique roses that will uh, be second prize, second level kind of prizes. So consider that. And she has tickets, and I think they'll be floating around town uh, quite a bit. But uh, take advantage of that program. In terms of uh, the butterfly copy, um, I've gotten pretty addicted to it. Uh, I've always been a bird watcher. And now, uh, you know, of course, it's a wonderful area for attracting birds to the landscape and just seeing birds in. Uh, wherever there's a, a thicket or blooming plants or uh, fruiting plants, you're going to have a nice selection of birds uh, to observe. And uh, butterflies are the same. Now, the, the real emphasis, everybody's kind of mobilizing for butterflies because of the monarch population situation. You know, we had those big freezes, and, and then we... Uh, the milkweed has disappeared. I grew up in Minnesota, and my all my farmer friends are, are not talking to me anymore because they used to. One of the topics, you know, if you went to the tavern was that darn milkweed, and I've got it. I've only got seven or eight tickets of it on my property now, and I'm going to get those in the next ten years. You know, so they finally get it. And now we declare, well, there's too much. We, eliminated too much milkweed, now the monarchs have no milkweed to, to lay their eggs on. So we're back. There's a whole bunch of initiatives in the, uh, to get milkweed planted. And, and it's relatively easy for a homeowner to get involved in this uh, in the butterfly attracting um, business. Uh, it's a, it's attractive uh, parts for your landscape and also very successful. You can, in the, in the first year you get involved, you can start really seeing uh, some results. Now, we've we'll talked about 12 months of nectar plants. Most of you are familiar with that. Um, butterflies go to plants that have nectar. Uh, and we'll talk a bunch about those. You want, you want to have them so that you have something always blooming. And there's a, a large list of plants that will provide nectar. Uh, my favorite nectar plants are zinnias, uh, mistflower, and uh, milkweed, and then there's one called porterweed, and that's the weirdest too. But uh, porterweed is a neat, uh, it's a neat plant. That, uh, anybody familiar with porterweed? Yeah, we're doing. We need to get more porterweed in the in the market too. You, you like weeds, don't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's what that's what that's what they say in Minnesota. <laughs> and we it should have a better name because it's very very interesting and attractive. And so twelve months is what we want. We're gonna talk about caterpillar plants. That's one thing we forget about quite often and it's the most uncomfortable part of resurrecting or renewing uh, the butterfly situation, or um, encourage them, encouraging them to, to come out in bigger numbers, because we, you know, there's some compromises we need to make in our our landscape uh, for the caterpillar plants, monarchs and milkweeds, and then other attracting tactics. Insecticide use in the landscape. That's that's one of the keys, uh, but it's relatively easy. I'm not an organic gardener. You know, I had a peach orchard for earned a living. Well, that's not the thing. I spent a lot of work on time, and and uh, only took me ten years to pay all my debts once I got out of the business. So I, I feel I feel lucky with my peach orchard. But I, I you know, I absolutely use effective uh, pesticides. Uh, but the less 
the less pesticides you use, the more success you have with butterflies. So we'll talk about that a little bit. 12 months of nectar plants, you, uh, we, we talk about, you know, so horticulture's uh, uh, garden or uh, writer in the local newspapers, I talk about uh, which plants to put in the garden and the landscape uh, the, each, all times of the year so that we can have 12 months of color and it's easy to do. It's easy to do here in, in South Texas and Central Texas. Um, and nectar plants are generally, you'll see from this list that they're, that they're uh, a lot, very diverse. You can find a whole bunch of them that you like the looks of it and the butterflies like it. Um, there is a handout that looks like most everybody's got it. It's kind of a one page front and back that summarizes this whole, whole presentation. Um, Starting in uh, March, April, and May, some of them are Coreopsis, Verbena, Salvia gregii, Phlox, Lavender Lantana, and Larkspur. Now, most years, we get to be this time of the year, and uh, I would show, talk about these plants, and like Lavender Lantana, in a lot of places, that'll bloom all through the winter, but not this year. They're flattened. They'll, be, they'll have to come back. The larkspur are coming up. Anybody have a naturalized larkspur? Yeah. yeah I always I always have to remove, they, they come up my raised bed and with my, you know, who would think that any any plant could overcome snapdragons, big rocket snapdragons, larkspur. And so I pull all of them except for two rows and I leave them in there because they're, they're tough. Yes, sir. Tambria forced forced the use of Coreopsis on Logan. <laughs> had to be. What was that? The Coreopsis had to be in the logo of our... Oh, oh is that, right. is that yeah. it in the logo? That's it. I mean, to tell you. Well, let me see what it looks like. Aren't you proud now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, we got a long list. Of, of plants and very attractive, very easy to grow. Are these all native? No. Oh, Tambria, you're not going to like that. They're not native. Well, she tells me some are naturalized. They got to be native. Well, you know how native plant uh, native plant advocates operate. If you uh, if you find a plant you like, you just enlarge the geographic area. Counts as a native. Yeah, yeah. So now and it's. Uh, and uh, us here, everything in central Mexico. Uh, it's it's not there. Yeah, it comes here. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah. But there are plenty of native choices that you can call them. Actually, the, yeah, there's a lot of good native plants. Um, and if, you've, uh, if you want to see a really nice native plant garden, uh, the Mitchell A. Audubon Center, you need to go there. It's all, all native plants and great butterfly garden. And it's attractive 12 months out of the year. Pretty flat now with the cold, but uh, it is you. You can do a good job with native plants. Now, of course, I one of my favorite set of plants are the tough my, uh, modern roses and the old-fashioned roses, and they're not native plants. So uh, there's a lot of them I like. My porter weed is not a native plant. Tropical. I don't mind them. It's just I get a lot of heartburn from uh -huh. that. <laughs> um, I have no problem with naturalized plants like <laughs> the Vincatex. That's I love. You that think one. you get hurt? <laughs> you, yeah. When I, yeah, if I write about Nandina or Vitex or anything in the paper, I get all kinds of response. Sometimes I just do it to see if anybody. <laughs> <laughs> and so far, they are. <laughs> Uh, June, July, August, I mentioned the zinnia plumbago. It's a tough, easy plant uh, to grow. Vinca, uh, Vinca the deer don't eat. It's a, an annual and a good butterfly plant. And then, of course, the milkweeds are big. Uh, cosmos, you can plant, you, you know, the one other thing about the cosmos, if you've got a vacant lot or you've got wildflowers, there's always an ugly period with wildflowers 
after they bloom. And you've got to wait for those who have wildflowers to, to mature their seed and, and drop their seed. So uh, I don't, if your household is anything like mine, there's a lot of pressure. To, Can't you mow those yet? Can't you uh, go out there and get that bush out and get that? And, and so one of the things I, that you can do is you can uh, just throw the seed, Cosmos seed out there. And Cosmos will bloom as soon as the weather warms up into, uh, oh, you, you, you can send it, do it down in April. Send it, uh, put the seed down in April and it'll be blooming uh, long before June. And then they reseed. And the, they're a great butterfly plant. They're a good seerscape plant, too. So uh, that's, that's one of the choices. And of course, poinciana, or Pride of Barbados, is a, a, a nice plant. It's not, it's not a native plant. Well, it depends on the definition. Okay. Um, September, October, November, the mist flower. So a lot of you are familiar with the blue mist flower. Mm -hmm. Greg's mist flower is the one that most of us use now because it starts blooming earlier in the year. Mist flower has always been a kind of a late bloomer. It is a plant that just gets covered with butterflies, uh, queen butterflies and monarchs when they're here. And but this Greg's but, uh, version, the Greg's version comes from West Texas. The uh, the other uh, version comes from East Texas, and it's a little slower to start blooming. Um, but uh, mist flowers is one we absolutely should have in your, your butterfly garden. Cone flower, vitis, fall aster, lantanas. The lantanas are, are a little disappointing to me when they start blooming because there's lots of other things the butterflies aren't attracted to. But as the fall progresses, they become more, more and more popular. And those last monarchs, before they, some, some of them will stay here too long, but um, they, they rely a lot on, on the lantana. And the Mexican bush sage and the, the late summer sages are, are good plants too. Some of the favorites, I mentioned the all-star plants, the milkweed. This tropical milkweed. There is a controversy involved in this. This is not a native plant. This, though, is a, a plant that is very attractive and works well in the landscape. It's easy to grow. So when, when, the mon when we all got involved with trying to save the monarchs, we said we needed, we needed uh, milkweed to grow. And there's about 15, 20 different kinds of native milkweed. And they're, as I mentioned, they're tough. They're hard to control once they're established. But they're very difficult to grow or produce. It's just taken us, Ginger and I went through this for a couple of years trying to get them at the South Texas Home Garden and Environmental Show. It's hard for the, the nurserymen to, to de determine how to reproduce those native milkweeds. They're getting better at it now. The tuberosa, the little one, is uh, relatively easy and, and available. And some of the others are too. But the one that was easy was a tropical milkweed. It was very attractive. Uh, so our, my recommendation was always make sure you have milkweeds and native milkweeds if you can find them and if not uh, tropical <coughs> milkweeds or a combination. And then if you want, one of the worries is that the, these uh, tropical milkweeds just keep blooming till the freeze kills them. So some winters in, in South Texas, they'll just keep blooming. And there, there's, there's research going on now, lots of research, uh, on whether that's a, a problem or not. Two, two questions about that. Do they, do they keep the monarchs here um, during the winter time? The other thing is, when they stay blooming like that, there's uh, some uh, microbes that, that develop on milkweed in the, and there's some research that indicates that the, the milkweed population grows. They haven't, there's no definitive answer on this, on that question yet. So, but one of the solutions is that you, when the monarchs should leave or um, sometime, uh, say the end of October, or even the middle of October, you go ahead and uh, just cut the tropical milkweed down. By then, the, the native milkweeds are all 
phoenix blooming anyway, um, but the, the, to do the same thing for the crop. That's, this te that's the temporary solution we're looking at. So you got the best of both worlds. You've got this wonderful nectar source. It also is, is a, a, a source or a, a breeding plant that is really attractive to the monarchs. And the monarchs will only lay their eggs on, on milkweeds, and this milkweed is very... When you put the tropical milkweed next to tuberosa, which is a native, um, they'll pick the tropical all the time. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, Gaeta Adjilski, the uh, one of the uh, one of the resource materials, she she questions <coughs> whether they ever nest on the tuberosa. It's a good it's a good nectar source, but she, she in her her garden she's never seen the uh, monarchs. Now you, you, we've got another another uh, butterfly queens that are closely related. You know we get the monarchs in the spring and the fall, and the queen butterflies that look a lot like monarchs are there all the time, and they'll 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 re reproduce on uh, almost any mel on any milkweed. But it uh, <coughs> seems to be an issue. <coughs> a lot of people are excited and interested in this whole topic and, and these initiatives on the monarchs. And if you go to the internet, you can see those initiatives. You know, this, all the cities along I-35 are involved. Senator Rivers Authority, the uh, uh, universities, all a lot of the universities uh, through that Central Flyway are, are involved, including uh, University of Texas and A&M. Um, so it's a real, there's a real opportunity there to be play an important part in that uh, program, and it's. it's it's really interesting because it's some neat research and great, great discussions going on. And the swallowtail on the Vinca and Gulf Fritillet area on the White Cosmos. Cosmos, uh, there's all different colors of Cosmos. The ones that I found are best for our uh, replacing wildflowers are the, the golden and the yellow. They're much, they're much more uh, aggressive and uh, sturdy than the, the, than the white ones and, and the pink ones, which are pretty and they'll grow, but um, the other, the yellow and the golden, they just keep coming back. Okay, caterpillar plants. I'm moving through this pretty fast, so you just stop me because um, I want to talk more about it. This is the this is the real key to it. A little di the difference of the interest in butterflies now than there were a few years ago. Everybody loved the butterflies, you know, flying around. They're tra they're attractive. You lot, lots of different um, species worth observing, except on the highway. Huh? <laughs> except on the highway. <laughs> you have to wash your car. Yeah. There's a you know there's there's lots of guidebooks on on uh, butterflies. There are not so many guidebooks on caterpillars, <laughs> but uh, caterpillars are an important part of this whole whole picture. And so, one of the most interesting things is that the caterpillars, I mean the the butterflies, are almost all of them are pretty specific. Not quite not quite as specific as the monarchs, and only use the milkweed, but pretty close. They all have a favorite plant, and if you want, uh, you want those uh, butterflies to uh, reproduce, produce caterpillars. You've got to have that plant available. Anybody grow uh, dill and fennel and parsley? Well, if you do, you got you'll get black black swallowtails. I mean, they find it. And you go out there, you know, you go out there for dinner. You're going to decorate your and the, last week you did it and it was very nice, you go out there, this week you got company. There's nothing, there's nothing left except about six caterpillars, eight caterpillars that have eaten all your, all your dill or all your parsley. Uh, another one is uh, the, that Gulf fritillary, we had a picture of that, it, uh, oh, it, uh, the vine, passion vine, you know, and that, it's a wonderful plant. Uh, and that, that's what they laid their eggs on. And if you've got, you know, passion vine can get pretty aggressive, but there's some beautiful landscape 
uh, versions, but and there's some some that are, are pretty tough native versions, and uh, they can get big and aggressive. They're not as bad as some of our vines, but uh, I've seen passion vine though with only flowers left, flowers and caterpillars, <laughs> and, then, and, then, and the uh, golf fertile areas have eaten them, stripped them completely, and it doesn't phase them. You know, it'd be two months later, they're all full of leaves again, and then four months later, they're all full of caterpillars again, so they, uh, they really rely on each other. So that, that's a lot of plants like that. Anybody recognize that? Doesn't it look like bird poop? Yeah. yeah. Oh, jeez. I wasn't going to say that. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, you know, we get, we get the call on the radio. I can't call it bird poop on the radio anymore. That's, uh, can't call it doo-doo either. Uh, ex excrement. Or, um, but we'd get the call, somebody on the, the phone, and say, I know you're not going to believe this, but something was eating my citrus, my lemon tree, and I went and looked, and all I could find was bird poop. <laughs> and then I, I still got eaten, and I went and looked, and they're alive. They're caterpillars, and they look like bird poop, and exactly <clears throat> they do. And uh, the good news about them are that they don't, they don't permanently hurt the tree. And generally, if you have six or eight, that's a lot. So what we recommend is a compromise with people because people love their lemon trees and lime trees and they don't want to reduce the, the yield. So you say, we say just leave a couple there to, to finish because it, it's, it's the uh, giant swall to very attractive. Mm -hmm. Showy. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the golf fritillary area on the passion vine. The caterpillars aren't, aren't very attractive, but the butterflies are, and they, they can really, they, there's a lot of them, and they can eat a lot of foliage. Mm -hmm. There's the dill, uh, black swallow dill, dill and parsley. And it, you'll find, you'll find if you've got your parsley by your front back door, or a lot of or kitchen garden, a lot of people laugh. They'll find it. And then the, then the mockingbirds may follow them in, too, and you wonder, why. Well, there's all that activity out there, and it's the <laughs> mockingbirds and other birds trying, you know, trying to eat the uh, caterpillar. Excuse me. Uh, this is monarchs and queens. The caterpillar looks almost exactly the same, except with the monarchs, there's <clears throat> two more antenna like appendages in the middle. And so, a lot, a lot of people in the fall say, I've got monarch caterpillars. And you have to say, well, go back and look at them. Are there three sets of those antenna-like um, <coughs> cells? And if there are, then, there, then they are monarchs. If there's only two, they're queens. The queen butterflies are here all year. And they generally nest all year. And both of them just use milkweed. Uh, but there's a lot of other ones. Uh, uh, the gray hair streak, <coughs> Esperanza, uh, Texas Crescent Spot, and Janice Patch is a really beautiful one. Uh, Flame of Campus, American Painted Lady, almost every garden has that. Cudweed, uh, and Buckeye on Ruelia, your dwarf Mexican Ruelia, or your, if you're uh, unlucky enough to have the full size Mexican between you, uh, they'll grow the dough. A breed on that too. And then Brazilian skippers on, can on canas, we used to call the, you know, we used to moan and groan as horticulturists and gardeners moan and groan about the damage on canas. Now that we love butterflies, <laughs> that we, we revised our opinion that the, the Brazilian skippers are a worthy uh, insect or organism to, who cares if they get a few wrapped up leaves on, on the cannas. And so that, that's what they do, they're the leaf rollers on the cannas. Now they're not as beautiful as some of the other butterflies, but they're, they're pretty attractive. Monarchs, that's the big issue. If you're familiar with the monarch, 
the, the uh, breeding cycle is just unbelievable. You know, they're, they're, win they're wintering down in Mexico right now in a forest area by Mexico City. They'll come up um, and get here about March, uh, April 1st. And then they get here and they, that generation <coughs> lays, starts laying eggs. When they get here and, uh, you know, as they go up, and then they die. That new generation only lives three weeks, only long enough to go to the north and stop and lay eggs and then